This is Maureen Elward. You're listening to Backcast Cape Ann. The stories you hear as part of Backcast Cape Ann series on the LBGTQ community highlights their contribution, care, and activism. It's a look back at experiences, significant moments, and persistent memories. For this episode in our series on the LBGTQ community, I interviewed Jack Vondras, Project Director at the Education Development Center in Waltham, Massachusetts, where he addresses substance misuse and prevention. He is Board Chair of North Shore Community Health that has centers in Gloucester, Salem, and Peabody. He's responsible for opening the health center in Gloucester, known as Gloucester Family Health, and he's the former Health Director for the City of Gloucester during 2003 to 2011. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Maureen. I want to I want to say that uh, of all the jobs I've had in my career, which have been a few, that the one that I had here with the city of Gloucester as the health director was my most favorite. And I always think of the uh, awesome time that I had here because I did take a really uh, firm community uh, response approach to my job here, and I'll talk about some of that. So, mm-hmm. so thinking back at my time here, at Gloucester uh, always gives me a good, warm, fuzzy. Well, feeling. welcome home, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and driving up 128 from Wakefield, where I live, um, gave me a great feeling of, of returning home. When I come over the bridge, it is just the most relaxing piece. Being a gay man, tell tell me a little bit about that and what your experience has been. Sure. So I, I need to go back because I need to talk about coming out, and uh, I came out as a teenager. Uh, when I was uh, about 15, uh, the circumstances weren't good. Uh, and I was uh, pretty much a homeless teenager from the, uh, in the state of New Jersey, and I was pretty much a throwaway. Um, but I did do one thing at that point. I realized that I needed to get away from the drugs, the homelessness, the issues that I was dealing with. So I left the state when I graduated from high school. Surprised I graduated, but that's okay. But I used that as an entree to come to Maine, and then I ended up getting a degree, a multiple sets of degrees on my own. But I want to talk about one of the things about being gay is that I always wanted to be a parent, and I couldn't figure that out because gay men weren't usually parents. So in the 80s, when I was um, coming into my 30s, I uh, teamed up with a woman by the name of Deborah uh, Delman, and she and I decided to have a child together. This was in the 80s, adoption and foster care was illegal in Massachusetts, and so we had really no models to work from. So we drafted a custody agreement, which was a huge endeavor at that point, and decided that we would go ahead and have a a child. Peter was born in 87, and uh, we co-parented through all those years, a week on, week off, and that was all predetermined. We needed to live in the same community. No one had done this before, so I just want to say that this was kind of setting the, setting the tone, and I really felt that gay men can be positive role models of parenting, um, and I love being a parent. It was my most favorite achievement of, 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 of me as Jack Vondras, because I just loved it. And my son now is 32, but I want to share a funny story about my son when he was a teenager with his mother and I. We were um, at a family event and he decided to come out as a straight kid. And we kind of <laughs> looked at each other because I have a few other members of my family are gay. My father was gay, um, closeted gay. And I just thought, you know, of course my son is gonna be gay. You know, he's biologically mine. <laughs> so um, when he said I, he's straight, his mother and I both kind of looked at him and, I, and we said, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so it was a lot of laughs, we still, a joke about it, but my comeback at that point was, we don't care what sexual orientation you are, we're open to diversity, and we'll figure this out. Mm-hmm. Because I had no clue of how to be the father of a straight uh, young male. <laughs> and we thought it was kind of a phase. We thought, oh, he'll he'll <laughs> do this for a couple of years, and he'll find his way, and he'll become gay. And it just didn't work that way. Right. He, he totally does... Uh, uh, gravitate to to females because when he walks down the street, he, his head always turns, and mine <laughs> turns the other way. So you know, it, it is what it is, and we've learned to adapt and accept, <laughs> and we joke about it all the time. 
So I was hired by the Board of Health, not by the mayor, even though I worked with John Bell, the mayor, loved working with John, he was an awesome mayor. And one of the missions of my task of coming here to Gloucester as the health director was to open a health center. At that point, uh, Hep C was really off the charts here in Gloucester. Opiates um, were just coming on the scene. And typically, the, you know, it's a fishing community. It's a, a strong background of being on the boats, which is hard manual labor. And any hard manual labor position like that will get injuries, hence the, the uh, impact on opiates. So knowing that, I really kind of approached the position of how would I actually hope in a health center year. And we had lots of discussions about it. The Board of Health was very involved with it. And... Uh, I'll say that it was really important for us to not develop it as part of the city budget. And I struggled over that because, of course, you know, you want to create your own positions and, and, and all that stuff. But I realized that health centers, as the budgets get cut back in the city, were they going to be impacting on my budget of the health center? Would I have to be laying off the doctors, et cetera? So I looked at a nonprofit entity that would help partner with me, hence North Shore Community Health, which is the entity that creates these nonprofit federally qualified health centers. So we run Peabody, Salem, and Gloucester as full federally qualified health centers. So I did that. Um, all the documentation, all the applications were from my title as the health director. Mm -hmm. Oh, I feel very proud. As a as an ex-health director, very few health directors get to open health centers. Right. So a great accomplishment. Love it. I had met my um, my to be husband right around the time I was coming to Gloucester, about I'd say about a year before, mm -hmm. and um, uh, we decided in 2008 that we were going to get married. It was legal in the state, and I really wanted to experience setting up a life with a partner as any other person would for the rest of their lives. And you can do that in this state. Yeah. So it really set a whole different change in our relationship to being uh, looking at permanence and mm -hmm. how do we co-parent a child mm -hmm. with, with my son. We didn't want to do it right away because I wanted it to, to be a conscious decision. So I had a, a couple of friends that they got married within days of the, of the overturning of that role in the state. We wanted to take our time and we chose a wedding date in uh, June of 2008. And I bring that up because at the same time as we were preparing for our wedding, Gloucester was going through an interesting uh, a set of turmoil around the teen pregnancy pact. And this was around access to birth control via the teen health center from the, the hospital, Addison Gilbert. As we were preparing for the last days of our wedding, the teen pregnancy pack was on, I think it was Newsweek or Time, I can't remember which news, which which of those two magazines, mm -hmm. but I think it was Newsweek. Teen packed Gloucester, it was everywhere. It was, it was picked up by the AP on a very slow Friday afternoon with an interview um, with Dr. Orr, and it went international. And I remember uh, uh, under Mayor Kirk, this is the second mayor I worked with, she really uh, kind of asked me, well, can you move your wedding? Because we were in the middle of a turmoil that I can't even talk about. I kind of looked at the mayor and I said, well, I really can't move the wedding. I mean, it's, you know, we've been in preparations for the wedding for about a year now, and it's kind of set. And I thought, would you have asked a straight woman or a straight man to move their wedding? And I, it, it kind of reminded me that gay partners and gay weddings were not really looked at as very serious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for me, that was totally the opposite. I was just like, of course I can't move my wedding. But I said that I would, as soon as I returned, I would turn this situation around and I drafted a plan before I left of how I would do that. And I'll talk about that second. Um, so we got married. And we went to Montreal for our honeymoon, which is a French-speaking city. And the goal was to not answer the phone, to not look at the press, to not be anywhere where I could be in, uh, exposed to the teen pregnancy issue that was going on for at least a few days. And every single newspaper in French, you could see the word Gloucester. And no matter what I could do, I couldn't get away from it. <laughs> and you know, I'd walk into a bookstore, or a bar or whatever I was, and there would be Gloucester spread across the front page. And I thought, oh, 
it's going to be a disaster. So we did a press release here, which was the one that speared the whole thing on Law and Order. We came back and I did a blue ribbon panel here on teen pregnancy issues. Uh, it was like in a movie with cameras everywhere at City Hall. And I remember the night I have a picture of me being up at the front of the podium and um, Mayor Kirk and this, the school committee uh, was there and uh, all the officials and cameras across the entire back side of City Hall of Gloucester. And if you've been in Gloucester City Hall, uh, majestical, yeah. beautiful building. I uh, love that building. The uh, Blue Ribbon panel was spectacular. They really did a great job and really made recommendations of how we could move forward on this mm -hmm. on a very complicated issue. Very Felt very proud of that. And I remember Mayor Kirk giving me a thumbs up uh, uh, during the presentation because mm -hmm. it was, you know, we were moving away from the, the crisis mm -hmm. at hand. As I said, I loved being the health director here. Um, one of the people that was very instrumental of me being successful was Fred Cowan. He was one of my board members. And he and I knew each other from the AIDS epidemic and some of the work I did at AIDS Action in the, in the late 80s and early 90s. He was one of my volunteers for the hotline. And uh, he really did believe that I could be successful in this job, which was really helpful. And, you know, the Board of Health is always complicated because it's, you know, it's a, it's a political board. It's appointed. Uh, and lots of things are coming up, tobacco regulations, uh, septic system planning, all that stuff that goes on that takes up forever. How did you get involved in the AIDS work? What propelled you into that work? And tell me a little bit more about how that brought the gay community together. And when I was the state nutritionist for WIC, I did some workshops on AIDS in the very early 80s. This is before Rock Hudson, etc. And that introduced me to learn a little bit more about HIV and AIDS in the very early stages. And this is before the community really started to come together to really kind of rally about what we needed to do to, to take it on. And I'll just say something about public health. Public health did not embrace AIDS and HIV. It really was created outside of the public health system. Mm -hmm. It's the only disease entity that ever did that. Mm -hmm. It was considered to be very political because Ronald Reagan was the president and he was not going to acknowledge condom distribution or a, HIV, or a needle exchange or anything that was needed for turning this epidemic around. And I think if we would have been more proactive in those early stages, we could have turned this around. And we lost that edge within a few years. But I want to talk about community. My husband, um, before we were married, he was a buddy, an AIDS buddy. And I worked on prevention work, doing lots of things around policy work. Um, I wrote the first policies around public sex outreach because we really needed to look at the different indicators around HIV. But we came together as a community to help take care of our brothers and our sisters that were dying. And I just want to acknowledge my lesbian sisters because um, they really weren't impacted at the same level as gay men because of the risk factors. Um, but they were the fabric of help of who helped take care of us. And I still, to this day, some of my most precious friends are those that I met during that era, and we worked together. So that could have been stuffing envelopes. I could have been doing condom runs at bars. I could have been uh, AIDS buddies. My husband and his buddy friends still get together, even though their clients have all died and the program is gone. They still get together every month uh, for, a, for a dinner at California pizza kitchen in Boston. And we, we talk about this, that even though the, the issue has shifted and, and changed, it's our community. Coming back to Gloucester, I felt the community was very um, encompassing and, and warm. And myself as an out gay man, it was never an issue. I never felt anyone ever gave me a hard time about anything. It didn't come up in my interviewing, obviously, because it's not illegal. It's not legal. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, never. I never had anyone really give me a hard time about it. At this point, I'm two months out from my retirement, fully from my, uh, my position at, at Educational Development Center, EDC as we call it. And, um, and I'm, right now I'm only working half time, and the two days that I have off are all those appointments that I don't want to do, which is Medicare, um, pension, uh, the TIA CREF, the retirement system I'm in now. Um, so every day is one of those wills, 
uh, health proxies, stuff like that. We need to do to prepare. I think um, I have a new appreciation of our ability as two people working together to get to this ready for this next stage. And I'm really appreciative that one, I can be married, two, I can deal with the benefits. Uh, the complexity of it is a little complicated at times because nothing is simple. <laughs> it's just not simple at all. And if you don't really work at it, it won't all come together. But um, but I'm really, uh, I, I love the fact that I get to spend the rest of my life with someone I really do care about. Um, and then this weekend, Peter, my son, was over the house helping me repair a sink. And we were talking about our last wishes of how we want to be taken care of. And, and he was very clear that I am going to take care of both you and Dave to the end. And then he has his mother and her husband. So he has four on that side, on our side, and then he has his wife and her parents. So I was just like, oh, wow, that's a lot of responsibility. He says, but you're all part of my life. And I'll say this at every single Thanksgiving that we have, where we have all of us at the same table, his mother, her side, me, my side, he always gives the same thank you. Um, of I love having my whole family together at one point. And again, that's the magic of that piece. And I think that us as two parents that really wanted to pe become parents and have worked hard at being co-parents, even though we're not in the same house, it, it, the, the magic has really worked. And, and, I, and I'm so proud of my son. Um, finished his master's recently. He's got a great job at a startup and uh, as a IT uh, uh, software expert doing well with his wife and they're ready to they're starting to uh plan for having my first grandchild oh, that's so, so exciting and i you know i i'm so excited about being a grandfather i hope that it happens it still has to come to fruition and those are not always so simple but this is my last bucket on my mm -hmm. my last bullet on my bucket list that's great so, that's great congratulations jack. thank you well jack vondras thank you so much for joining us on the podcast thank you i appreciate it Backcast Cape Ann is a production of 1623 Studios. This show was produced by me, Maureen Elward, with technical assistance from Becky Tober. Find Backcast Cape Ann on 1623 Studios' Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find all our podcast episodes on 1623studios.org.